Hi, Nisha here, and as I'm recording this, the high today was about 8 degrees, so definitely not a range day. And there haven't been a lot of new guns, and the few that we've had, we've shown you. So I thought a fun kind of topic would be top five mm, lesser known, lesser talked about, just kind of less than uh, thought of pre-band guns. Just guns that came in back in the day that don't get a lot of attention. I, I don't want to say rare, because I didn't pick these based on import numbers. Just ones you don't hear about. Typically when you hear pre-band, people talk about Chinese AKs or Uzis, things like that. So in this video, I'm going to pick five that I happen to have that are just not all that well known. But first, we're going to start off with a pre-band not on the list that is well known. In fact, when I think of pre-band, this is one that comes to mind. The Austrian-made Steyr AUG SA, which is a semi-automatic version of the military AUG A1. Now, pre-band. When it starts, it doesn't really matter. Some guns were coming in as early as the 60s, 70s, what have you. But the ban was a hard stop in March of 1989. Recently, we put out a video on uh, some laws. You can check it out. But essentially, that was an executive order, part of a larger EO, uh, uh, aimed at being tough on drugs, that was signed by President George H. Bush. It tried to ban so-called assault rifles, and it did so. It had a list of names and manufacturers, but it also crossed off a lot of features. For example, flash hiders, folding stocks, pistol grips, etc. So, pre-ban, we're talking guns that came in before the spring or late winter of 1989. So yeah, when I think of pre-ban, the AUG comes to mind because until the last decade or so, getting an AUG was very difficult, and pre-bans were going pretty crazy in money. And a number of these came in. It seems like they started to come in around 82, 83, and uh, about five or 6,000 came in. Pretty good number. But not enough to meet demand. Now this is the standard version, 20 inch barrel, the earlier style open tulip flash hider, green fixed one and a half power optic, and of course it takes AUG magazines, which are not AR compatible. This is the 42 rounder, why didn't I put a 30 in? Honestly, because I grabbed a 42 before I grabbed a 30, so that's what we got. Yeah, this to me is one of the quintessential pre ban guns, uh, that'd be a good place to start. And I always like to give Steyr credit because they, they've they always been a, a target for the anti-gun lobby, and they still keep bringing guns around. This was the very common version. There were some black 16-inch, quote-unquote, police carbines that came in towards the end, and there were a few of the 24-inch guns at the heavy barrel, and there were very few so-called special receivers that replaced the optic with a rail, although it was not a true 1913 rail, Picatinny, because it came in before. But yeah, this would be an example of what I would consider a very good, very desirable pre-band type gun, but one that's pretty common, and, you know, you could, you could find them relatively easy, even if they were quite expensive. And with that, let's look at the first one I kind of decided to almost arbitrarily put in this video. Number five, the FMAP FSL. This was a semi-automatic FNFAL pattern rifle built in Argentina at Rosario. And of course, a lot of FAL types came in in the 80s. We have, of course, the original Belgian. You had some from Israel. And you had those from Brazil, from Imbel, probably the most famous today. At least outside the originals. But 
the Argentinian guns get overlooked. They did come in in much smaller numbers. They were brought over by National Arms and uh, Arms Corps. The FSL was developed around 1982 after the Falklands War in Argentina, frankly, to drum up some money because they needed it. And so it would appear in America a short time later. And this is the standard version with a 21-inch barrel. Fixed stock. And it has the tall sights. The open ear is a giveaway. They also imported some short sight versions. I think National... Mostly did the short sights and arms core did the tall. Has the standard features. Carry handle. Feeds from standard FAL magazines. And it has the military grade paint over phosphate finish. And it's just, I have a thing for Argentine FALs. I just, I think they're very utilitarian, very military. They have this nice matte finish to the furniture, not the glossy that you find on the Belgian. And about the only changes they made from military, aside from being a, a semi-only, which by the way, even in the uh, Argentinian military, a lot of the rifles were restricted to semi-only because of the selector. It was the heavy barrels that were full auto. But anyway, the only changes they made, they gave it a different muzzle device. It still has the notch for a bayonet, but it does not have the cut for the grenade ring. And the reason they did this, technically, the 1968 Gun Control Act did forbid grenade launchers on guns. So that was their way to comply easily. Also, for whatever reason, it's not internally threaded for a blank fire device. I would imagine since they had to make a special muzzle device, they just didn't see a reason to take the extra step to thread it. But of course, if you want, you can unscrew this and put on a standard FAL flash hider. I just, why? But yeah, only a few hundred of these came in pre-ban. Of course, most were like this one. There was also a paratrooper with a folding stock and short 17 and 3 quarters barrel. There was also a Congo with a fixed stock and an 18-inch barrel. And there was maybe the least common, I don't know, the Congo might be, the heavy barrel version 2. All really, the, the rest are, are very uncommon. But the funny thing is, as uncommon as these are, as, as few as actually came in, at least up until the last couple of years, they were criminally undervalued. People would go for the Belgian or even the Imbel, and they just didn't know that the FMAP, the Rosario guns, existed. On top of that, in the 90s, about 3,000 or so, maybe 4,000 guns were imported by a southern arms company, SAC. These are the ones marked Sac Lata. And to <clears throat> comply and get around the 89 ban, they essentially split them up. They sold the barreled action through one company, and then you could buy the lower and other stuff through another. And of course, that meant they were usually mismatched. So there was a good number of post-ban examples out there. And they're very nice condition too, so that's okay. But I think that has kind of overshadowed the fewer pre-bands. On top of that, some just stripped receivers came in. They were these Type 3 style, without the lightning cuts. And of course, there were parts kits available from uh, Sarco. They were the Type 4 with the short front sight and the flip rear. And they were in superb, essentially brand new condition. So you could buy one of those, buy a receiver, bam, have yourself a very nice FAL. So yeah, with all those things going on and with all the other imports, these just kind of got over overshadowed. And uh, so even though a pre-band FAL is very common, a pre-band Argentine is not. And bipod was optional on these. It's a QD style. I just had to include an FAL, and I have this... Really great appreciation for the Argentine versions. So this is a solid number five for me. If you if you run across one, uh, look to see if it has the Sac Lata marking inside the Magwell 
on the opposite side, and there it'll just say Sack Lata. If it is, it's a post-ban. The quality is the same, just don't pay pre-ban prices for a post-ban gun. But yeah, uh, if you're looking for an Mbell and you run across an FMAP, you might check it out. Personally, I kind of like them better. Not saying bad things about Mbells, just kind of like these better. With that, let's move on. Number four, the Daewoo K1A semi-auto variants. <laughs> the Daewoo K2 was underappreciated for a long time, although in more recent years it is getting some uh, it's getting some traction. And people famously know that it's a long stroke piston system, kind of derived from the AK. And while this K1 type isn't unknown or rare per se, it's just not as popular and, and known because it's a direct impingement gas system. It's much more AR-15, although it does have a double recoil system allowing it to have a retractable stock. The original K-1 dated back to around 1976 when the South Korean Special Forces needed a new submachine gun type to replace like older grease guns and what have you. And they took inspiration from the XM-177. Well, what they came up with around 1980 and 1981 was the K-1. And that was a short, around 10-inch barrel gun. Direct impingement for saving weight. Modified bolt and a retracting stock with multiple uh, positions. This is fully out. Unlike a lot of wire stocks, it has several notches and can be pretty long. Or quite compact. And here it is. So, making it pretty small. Or it can be removed altogether very easily. Now, the K1A was a slightly product improved version, with the big difference being a new, longer flash hider that kind of resolved a lot of issues. And that came into service around 1982, and all K1s were retrofitted. So yeah, K1 was the original K1A. That was still a uh, semi-auto, uh, excuse me, a full auto gun. As far as semis here, the first importer was Stoger, who started to bring these in around 1985. And they used the name Max 1 for the K1A semi-auto. And what makes this unique, it still fires 5.56, 223. It feeds from standard AR-15 mags, which is good because a lot of pre-bands take proprietary mags. And they extended the barrel out. Now, this is not common. You didn't see a lot of shorties getting imported back in the day. Not unless they were kind of based on submachine guns. And the way they did it was very neat, too. They only extended the barrel out long enough, about 14 inches, and then they took the K1A style flash hider and pinned it on very cleanly. I mean, you, there's no weld marks visible or anything. To give it an overall length of just 16 inches, extremely well thought out, much more of a modern way of making a short barrel meet the minimum length. You just, you just don't see that a bunch in the 80s. That's really cool. Anyway, they would change the name from Max 1 to K1A1, still under uh, Stoger, and then IAC would take over importation, first keeping the K1A1 name around 1987, but then around 1988, they would rename it once again to AR110C. Don't ask me why. And then, of course, when the ban came down in 89, that ended these. It would have been hard to make this comply with the ban because of the stock and the way they did the barrel. You know, they had to do something about the flash hider. It would have looked really wonky in a post-ban configuration. Now, the more popular K2, they were able to turn into the DR200 and import those through about 97 but it was a little easier to make it uh, band friendly. It's also worth pointing out that the uh, 
the K2 there had several name changes. It started off first as the Max 2, then the K2, and then finally the AR100. So the name changes happened for both. And yes, this is the wrong sling, but I like it on this one better than the factory one because the factory one's heavy. This is a gun I really enjoy shooting. I think it's neat. And uh, when you talk Daewoo, if people hear of Daewoo, they always think of the K2. The K1 just isn't thought of. And while I understand that it has some shortcomings, I think it's just an interesting design, and I think the import history behind them is um, is interesting. And no one really knows how many came in, the records from Stoger and IEC or, or Long Gone, but you don't see a lot of the K1, A1s, Max 1s, AR 110Cs, so, you know, probably a couple of thousand, maybe, maybe three or four thousand. That's a complete guess. But I thought it had to be on this list. It's just a, a really neat gun. Number three, a gun that pretty much all of you know, although the import you may not. The Spanish Set Me. Yeah, most of you know the Set Me because it was the predecessor and then later concurrent gun with the HK G3. And of course, lots of guns have been assembled from parts kits, including from Century Arms, their Set Me Sporters which have given them a mixed bag reputation. But what some may not know, probably you know because you're smart, but others may not, is that there were some authentic Spanish-made semi-autos imported back in the 60s. The company was named Mars, and they were out of Chicago, Illinois. Around 1964, about the time that the improved Model C was coming into full production, they negotiated with the company Setme over in Spain to be the exclusive importer of a semi-automatic version known creatively as the Setme Sport or Setme Sporter. And it seems like by 1965-66, the contract was done and uh, guns were getting shipped over. But it would be kind of a mixed thing there. This was early days. And in fact, it was pre-68. So it's interesting what they did. My gun here is lightly modified, but not permanently so. Let me explain. One thing, this lower, it's still a push pin lower right here. But the pin was moved further back from here originally on a full auto. And on this side, you can see a dimple put in the lower. That's to keep a full auto trigger pack from going in. That was the main thing they did to appease the ATF. They retained the flash hider, also the ring for the grenade launcher. Again, this is pre-68, so no one cares. Now, interestingly, originally, this was flat here. It didn't have the bayonet lug. They just removed that to try to appeal to the sporting market more, and I guess they just didn't see why a civilian needed a bayonet. Apparently, civilians needed grenade rings, but not bayonets. But the nice thing is this whole piece is removable because that's where your cleaning kit's at, so putting one on is easy-peasy, and that's what I did. Back here, looking at the top of the receiver, see these mounts? Now, originally, the Spanish Set Me C used a claw mount similar to what HK would have, but they kind of replaced that with these. They're not, they're not, they're not standard, but they're like a weaver mount style for a scope. So they went to a different scope system, still kept the rear sight. And they still fed from Spanish 20-round magazines, although oftentimes they were shipped with a magazine block to 10 or even 5 rounds, again, to kind of appeal more to the sporting market. Likewise, originally, they gave a very... They took the standard plastic pistol grip and polished it to have a very shiny hue. They also polished the wooden stock and handguard to give those a shiny hue. And instead of having the military butt plate, they gave it a sporter, kind of a, 
corrugated shotgun looking butt plate that said set me in big letters on it of course i replaced the butt stocks on mine and kept the originals but yeah they, they did all those things they also x-rayed the gun to make sure there were no problems in the metal and they ground flush the welds and they give them a very smooth even phosphate finish it's the same kind of phosphate as on the military gun but they put a lot more care into making it attractive it's very clear that set me try to put their best foot forward with these mars guns they really did everything they could to spiff them up give them some added features and they pretty much flopped why well these fire 762 nato which is ubiquitous today but in the mid 60s was not all that common of a cartridge in america not like it is now on top of that they were pretty expensive they were 250 to 300 bucks in 1960s dollars which is over two thousand dollars in today's money so pretty high for what it was on top of that Spanish guns had a mixed bag reputation thanks to a lot of surplus Mausers available. And finally, the American market back then just did not like military style guns by and large. That just wasn't the vogue. Back then, people were collecting 19th century guns if they were collecting at all because collecting guns was just not like it is today. It was a different time. So unfortunately... After a few years, it seems like the final batch came in around 1969, 1970, maybe 1971. And we don't know how many Mars brought over. Some say 800. That seems low. The high-end number seems to be around 1,250. And that seems about right. 1,200, 1,250. Not a big number. It's worth pointing out, the only major variation the first couple of hundred, instead of having the wood handguard, had the early Model B metal handguard with integrated bipod. But then the rest, say a thousand, came with the wood handguard. And that's okay, because you can still put the standard Spanish bipod, the clip-on one up front. I've had quite a few of these come in the store, at least based on how few they seem to be. At least I've had four or five, and I finally eventually kept this one because it does have a little bit of pitting on one side and a little bit of wear, and I like that because it's one I can shoot, and it really is a fun gun to shoot. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was well over before even the 80s began. It's a shame because I think if these had been imported a little later... They would have met with better success as the 70s and 80s drew on military type guns became more popular so i think this was just a little too early they were certainly well-made guns but expensive so yeah there were some authentic spanish set me model c's but there were never any set me model l's unfortunately that would have been really kind of neat but uh, we just never got those yeah, but we've done full videos on this, so check it out if you'd like to hear more about the history of both the full and semi-autos. But I definitely had to talk about this one because it's just neat, and it's a gun that I do pull out quite frequently to admire and shoot. Number two, and it has a bit of a mystery surrounding it, the AR-70-223, or Model 70 Sport built in Italy by Beretta. This is a semi-automatic version of the AR-70-223, used in limited numbers by the Italian military beginning around 1972 and running up through the late 80s, early 90s. And it's a very interesting gun because it started off, at least it was inspired by work done between Sig and Beretta in the 60s. And they would split ways in 1968, with Sig going on to create the SG-540 and eventually SG-550. And Beretta would go on to create the AR-70 here and the AR-7090, ironically adopted at the same time as the SG-550. So they actually have a lot in common. 
But you hear a good bit about the SIGs, especially today, because of our channel never shutting up about them, and of course thanks to JDI's import of them. But you don't hear much about the Berettas. And they really didn't come in. <laughs> By that I mean they were brought over in boxes mark marked for shotguns. And some sources seem to kind of indicate that Beretta... Italy really wasn't wanting to bring over rifles or Beretta USA, but it's a little unclear, but it seems like these were kind of slid in, that they had really only intended to do shotguns and handguns, and uh, these kind of came over under the radar. How many? No one really knows. Some numbers say a few hundred, some say a couple of thousand. I think the highest number I've seen was like 3,000. 500 they're not common are they uber rare mm, maybe not but they're not common so what did they do to make them semi-auto well the back here is pretty much the same as to the military gun the only difference originally when these came in they did not have the flip up rear grenade sight but it could be easily added back they also, for some reason, at least typically, did not come with the bipod. And they definitely didn't have, originally, the bayonet lug under here. Or the front grenade sight here. But luckily, all of these are on a single piece. And this just comes off for routine cleaning because of how the gun disassembles. Ironically, they did have the flash hider and the grenade ring, because that's just part of this device. And they have the, another proprietary top scope mount here. So they were sporterized a bit for importation, and they feed from rock and lock magazines. This might look like a Galil mag. It's not. It's in no way interchangeable. This is the standard 30. There was also a 15, often the Sport came with. In the operating system, the internals, anyone who owns a Swiss 5.5X gun, they are exceedingly similar because of their partnership. In fact, in design, they are very similar. But because they aren't well known, for a long time, they were valued at one quarter or even one fifth what a Swiss would be. And that was a shame because Beretta quality is extremely high. And these are extremely well made guns. They were just not all that well known. Again, they were, they were kind of brought over in a quiet manner. The gun they're based on was not full military service. It was kind of a stepping stone to the, what would become the standard service gun. They feed from proprietary mags that are usually pretty expensive. So they were a good gun for the getting for a long time, although finally they've kind of achieved a certain level of popularity and the prices have risen. Nevertheless, it's not a terribly well-known gun compared to many others. There have also been some parts kits come in. Numeric had quite a few, and various American manufacturers have made the receivers. And yes, there have, in very recent times, been the AR-70-90 kits come in, but without barrels. And as of right now, no one is doing a receiver for those, but don't worry, someone will. And uh, we will definitely talk with you about that when they are available. But I had to mention this gun in this video because this is actually the gun that got me thinking about this video topic. Again, it's not rare, truly. There's, you know, several hundred to a couple of thousand here. And it's not a mystery gun. It's not unknown. But it's still pretty cool. <laughs> and I just thought, yeah, this is one of those guns we don't, just don't think about a lot. But I often get it out and ponder why... It's kind of left in the dust while the Swiss guns get a lot of the glory. When I think this is really every bit as well made and, and neat. 
but that could just be me. What do you think? I love how these come apart too. It's so different. So I think this is definitely a solid number two and one of the prides in my uh, my collection. When at the beginning I said I wasn't going to do anything truly rare in this video, I kind of fibbed a bit. Number one. My LM5 South African Galil R5 based semi-auto. And you've seen this in multiple videos, but... It kind of just needed to be here, I, I thought. And it is it is a gun that I get out quite frequently, and we shoot. Now, of course, in the 80s, you had IMI Galils come over. A Magnum Research and Action Arms were the two main pre-ban importers. Ironically, Mossberg brought over Galil receivers in the 90s. It's just weird. Uh, Springfield also brought some over. And they sold very well. They did the ARM, and they actually did the AR mostly for the American market. But those both had the 18-inch barrel folding stock. Springfield made a very good name for themselves by bringing over uh, contract versions of guns. For example, with the FAL, the Belgian FAL was a little expensive, so they brought over an Imbel FAL from Brazil that was quite a bit cheaper. The HKG3 was a little pricey, the HK91, so they brought over the SAR3 from Greece. They, they Yeah, they made a name for themselves by doing very good quality guns, but at a lower price. Well, a company back then, called TNT, thought, let's challenge the IMI Galil by bringing over semi-auto versions from South Africa. Made by Vector, Littleton. And they'd already done, or already were doing, I should say, some automatics over there called the LM4 for the full 18-inch barrel and the LM5 for the 13-inch barrel, which was analogous to the Glial SAR. And that would be particularly good to do an LM5 over here because I W excuse me IMI was not doing a semi-automatic pistol or rifle back then they were pretty much all rifles that's just how the 80s were uh, based on the SAR so that could have given them a little bit of a, an edge and the South African guns were well machined and they had some beefed up parts like a stronger gas tube larger front sight. They had a longer stock, which American shooters would often like. So it was a really good idea. And it got quite far. In fact, this gun. In 1985, a kind of pre-production batch was sent over. How many? No one knows. 10 to 20, at a best estimate. And these were to give TNT some samples to show off at trade shows, also examples to give to the ATF for testing, and just to have things they can, you know, th this is how importation works. Usually you have one or two or a handful come in, they get checked over, and then if they're good, you get the thumbs up and you do full production. And things were going well. The ATF approved them. They were good-looking guns. They had the full features. For the barrel, what they did, they put on this extension, to bring it to 16 inches. It, it works. This one is dated uh, June of 1985, which tells you about when these were sent over and everything. Notice it doesn't have the cutout for the rail like a like a um, Israeli. It also doesn't have a bayonet lug because of the short barrel and because there's typically didn't. It does have the unique folding stock. It does have Flip up night sights. So things were well underway to have an affordable South African Galil. But then, around October of 1985, under the Reagan administration, because of various international things, South Africa was sanctioned. American companies were not allowed to do business with them. And as you can imagine, that put the kibosh on any plans to bring over guns. And there you have it. That's the end. Meaning that 
those pre-production, those pre-samples, were effectively the only ones to make it over. Were there any LM4s? I've heard rumors of them, but I haven't seen them. LM5s, I've seen at least two others out there besides this one. So who knows? But it's a neat gun. It's fun to shoot. One weird thing about these, the rubber used both on the original. This originally had a slightly different stock. This is a South African stock, but it's a single piece design. They had a version that was very much like this, but it had a rubber uh, two-piece butt plate. That was rubber. The buffer back here is rubber. And the um, the firing pin, instead of having a spring, had a little buffer that kind of looked like an eraser. Anyway, for whatever reason, the rubber used, or maybe the preservative put on the guns, like the oil, the grease, ate away at the rubber. In fact, I've read sources from over in South Africa, people posting on forums, they would buy, say, a brand new LM4, LM5 over there in the bag, never touched, and the butt plate was crumbling and the, the buffer in the uh, back was crumbling and the firing pin was stuck because that had crumbled. Whatever, either the rubber they used was went bad after time or chemicals, because these came in very highly greased, very highly oiled. Either way, the rubber deteriorated on these and did so in the LM5s over in South Africa, too. So if you happen to find one, don't be surprised at the butt plates toast. And uh, you will want to replace the rubber buffer in the back. Luckily, a standard glue will fit. For the uh, firing pin one, I was lucky enough to import two or threes uh, from South Africa. So I just keep a couple in the... Uh, in the pouch just to have some spares because you never know worst case you could fabricate one it's just a piece of rubber i mean <laughs> heck maybe an eraser really would work but uh, and it probably would work without it and the floating firing pin would probably be okay so yeah when you think of pre-band you definitely think of galils from the 80s and those are cool but i always like the sar look and since there's not an israeli sar I guess this will have to do. No, I really do like the uh, the South African styling they did with the Galil. And it's a legit pre-ban, and it's a gun that almost was in America. It could have been the next M-Bell, you never know. Very sad that uh, things happen, but that's kind of what we've always said about importation. So many things can uh, can end them, sometimes before they even get get started. It's not just, you know, anti-gun laws. It, it could be international sanctions. It could be, recently, for example, one reason that caused the PE-90s to be delayed coming in from Switzerland, the shipping company was temporarily out of business that JDI had been using. That delayed things for like three weeks. Uh, it could be the overseas company goes out of business. It could be that the overseas government tells the overseas company it can't do it. It could be so many things... So many things have to line up properly for uh, an import to happen. And that's why, as time goes on, sometimes imports are just in tiny numbers. Even if they hope to bring over tens or hundreds of thousands, sometimes it just isn't in the cards. Or sometimes they bring it over, like the Mars sent me, and um, it just doesn't work. Yeah, the sales aren't good enough to import another batch. So the takeaway is, if there's an import you want and it's available, if you really want it, best not to put it off. Uh, grab it, because you just don't know. You just don't know. So this seemed like a kind of a fun topic for a video on a cold, cold day. What do you think? Uh, what, what would you classify as imports before 1989 that don't get the love, don't get the attention that they deserve? Yeah, let's have a discussion in the comments below. As always, if you could, like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to help support the channel, please check out the link to our Patreon page. This is Misha, and Jay and I both will catch you very soon next time.